Welcome back to this edition of On Every Front, showcasing our citizen soldiers and airmen as they answer our nation's call to duty. I'm your host, Army National Guard Staff Sergeant Adam Fishman. Carrying on despite hardship or trauma, persevering by pulling through adversity, and remaining alive after an event in which others have died, this is what characterizes a survivor. In this month's episode of On Every Front, we take a look into the story of a survivor and how she held on and persevered through her toughest moments, reminding all of us how to remain strong, resilient, and connected to one another in the face of such tragedy. Angela Powell Wolf, and uh, I am a photographer and a military spouse, mom, master of all trades, I guess. <laughs> Not quite eight years ago now, I uh, started a career in full time photography, a switch over from marketing, um, big switch. And uh, my dad had a love of photography, um, I think, since he was very young, and so. It was one of the things that we kind of were able to do together. He was always my first, first person I told about pretty much anything that was going on. So, and we were very, very close. He served both active duty as well as you know, Reserve National Guard. It was great. It, I remember guard weekends, you know, he would, he always enjoy them. We had a very close guard family. When he was overseas and deployed, that was not so great, as you can imagine. Um, I think his first first major time he was gone is when he was deployed for um, Desert Storm. I think I got one or two phone calls the entire six or so months that he was gone, and. Um, you know, letters would take months to arrive. He was an MP, so um, had a lot of interaction with EPWs, the enemy prisoners of war, and uh, that was terrifying for me. Um, so it was a big relief when he came home. It was good news when he decided to retire after 25 years, and uh, that was back in 2003. The photo down here is uh, that was actually taken in 1979 at Fort McClellan, Alabama. And uh, he was a, a new MP and uh, very proud of, of what he'd accomplished. Um, and then, you know, the photo overall, the bigger photo, um, is actually the last photo I have taken of my dad. And this is um, headshots that he went to have done for his real estate uh, business cards. So um, that's kind of, you know, how I remember him last time I saw him. After his retirement, he, uh, he also left a civilian job at that time. Um, and he moved from Michigan down to Florida. Um, he was ready to enjoy retirement. He was you know, 50 years old and basically had a, you know, it's a whole new opportunity ahead of him for a career. He was hoping to work mostly with retired veterans. He was also working on getting his license and becoming a, uh, a dive charter captain. Um, scuba diving was probably his second love. You know, he was looking forward to enjoying the time, being able to go out and do that and, and make a little bit of money doing it, and, but still stay connected to the military and the veteran community through his real estate. I think it was a big shift from being busy, 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 go, 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 um, always moving, always working on something, um, to I've got all this time on my hands, you know, what do I do with myself now? 
The last time I saw him was on my birthday in 2004, so April 11th of 2004. On the morning of August 7th, I received a phone call from my sister-in-law, and um, she told me, she's like, you need to come over here right now. And at the time, I was living about 20 minutes away from my brother and, and his family, and um, she wouldn't tell me anything over the phone. And so I got over there, and uh, that's when my brother told me, you know, the house was, we walk in, the house is dark. So I walk in, and, and that's when he tells me, you know, Dad died. I was like, what do you mean Dad died? You know, he's 51 years old, and there, there's no way. He's healthy. I've never seen anybody that was as healthy as he is. He's up at 4 o'clock every morning and did his working out and very, very active. And so I kind of took over and did what my dad probably would have done. Um, very uh, detail, take charge oriented kind of guy. And I took over and I was like, all right, well, we're going down there. And so we got there the next morning and um, still had no idea what had happened. And, and that's when she had explained that he had taken his life. So it was a shock. You know, we, know, we knew he'd struggled with um, depression and some PTSD. I just got an email from him the night before. I think my dad was having a hard time coping with being separated from his military community. All of his friends in Michigan were friends from the Guard and um, you know, his battle buddies, and they, they all knew. Um, you know, they'd seen the same things. They, you know, they'd been spending time together for 20-some years, and um, you know, he wasn't around that now. He didn't have that kind of support and camaraderie made the phone calls to the appropriate people that needed to know and you know asked my uncle if he would speak at the memorial service you know just just kind of I'm there I'm strong if no one else can be strong that that's what I'm gonna do it took about a year before I actually fell apart um, and processed my you know, my grief and what had happened it kind of hit me like whoa you know this is a major life change that I just went through in the last year so uh, when it did, it was, it was shocking, and I was literally, you know, I'd made new friends, um, but I was literally quite alone and didn't have anybody that could relate to kind of deal with it. Yeah, eventually, you know, met my now husband and um, even kept it from him for a long time, not, not how my dad died, but how I felt about it. Um, when, and it, it got really complicated. Um, because I would, I would have these times where I just didn't want to be around anybody. So it, it took me you know, some time and, and finding some other organizations that could help me. I found TAPS, um, which was a big help because finally I was around people who got it and they knew how I was feeling and could relate and, and kind of share their journey with me. Um, and I also found uh, the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, and they have a lot of great programs, and, and uh, I actually got very involved with them. Um, I sat on their board of directors in San Diego, and that was kind of my way of coping, was getting involved in the prevention efforts and uh, participating in the Out of the Darkness walks and, and that sort of thing. My, my coping mechanism now is do what I can to make sure that there's not another daughter that goes through this, or a wife, or a sister, or a son, or um, parents, grandparents, friends. You know, it's, it's a, astonishing the number of, of veteran suicides that we have every year. And so, um, you know, if maybe by you know, helping someone else, I can prevent someone else from going through that horrible grief journey that is you know, inevitable with suicide. It's, you know, everybody's is different, but it's, it's horrible no matter which way it happens. So um, that's kind of become my, my saving grace, I think. You know, I can just spend my time focusing on my camera, and even that's just a very healing and cathartic experience. It helps bring me closer to him without remembering the, the way he died, because that's not who he was. Um, it was all the other things, you know, the photography and sailing and diving and camping and, and all the other little crazy stories we have about him that makes up who my dad was rather than focusing on how he died. You know, whether it's travel or even taking pictures of my daughter, um, 
I, I kind of get a double reminder then because she looks so much like him and acts like him and has the same smile because she's just like him, um, which is great. It's hard sometimes, um, but uh, I think she feels pretty close to him too. It's nice to have that little piece of him still living on in her. There's a picture of, of him and I. I'm driving the boat, it's just he and I. And um, even though you know my hair's all messed up and I got sunglasses on and you know my dad was a giant freckle in the sun and you know it was still probably one of my favorite pictures because it was it was just what we did. I have had several friends in the past that they've got friends who are struggling or have you know a family member who said, "Well, I just want to die," and they call me and say, "What do I do?" Um, so you know if if that helps one person, it's worth it. But uh, being alone for so long um, and not realizing that there are other people out there, especially military suicide survivors, um, that it was very important for me to connect with them. And I think my healing process, it accelerated tenfold once I finally found that there was a community, you know, I found them through TAPS, and, uh, and I found out, hey, I'm not the only one here. It's just, it's an important message to get out there that, you know, hey, you're not alone, or if, if you are struggling, there's help out there. And, you know, look what happens. This is, this is the aftermath. Um, you know, it, it tears families apart. It's, it's something that even 10 years later, I think about it every day and struggle. Sorry. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it affects my daughter. Um, she never knew my dad, but it, it affects her. Um, she knows how he died and, uh, Sorry. <laughs> um, she's actually, she's participated since she was three. Three, is that right? In the Out of the Darkness walks for AFSP and, you know, can tell you, you know, suicide's bad, this is what happens. And um, so again, you know, if that gets to one person who's struggling or one family member who feels like they're lost um, because they don't have their loved one anymore, um, that's worth it. It's, you know, it's one less family that has to go through this. I'm a survivor. Um, I do feel like I've, I've been tried by fire and, and come out on the other side. Um, but it's also not something that you just pass through and, hey, you won. Um, you know, it's not like running a marathon. If you're going through a hard time, um, you know, if you're struggling with depression, reach out to your battle buddies or your family members, your friends. Um, if you're a family member who's got someone who's struggling, you know, there's resources out there for you too. You're not alone in this. You don't have to be afraid to say the words suicide or um, don't worry about the stigma. Just get help for yourself or your family member. Um, you know, and if you're surviving a loss, again, there's help for you. Um, you don't have to go this al alone. And that's the biggest message, no matter, you know, what, what side of the coin or the die that you're on, there's, uh, there's help and support. And you don't need to do this by yourself. Suicide survivors represent a stronghold in National Guard resilience. A beacon for others in need to rely on as a resource for support. Angela's story represents a Guard family's struggle, resilience, and achievement. But most importantly, her story represents an example of what could lie ahead for those who simply seek out assistance and ask for help. Stay tuned for upcoming episodes, and thanks again for watching this edition of On Every Front. Whether at home or abroad, your National Guard is everywhere America needs us to be. Always ready, always there.